It was uh, roughly 25 years ago uh, when I was living in El Paso that my uh, older brother was celebrating his 40th birthday. And he asked if I would take him along with a large group of friends that were visiting for the occasion out to the desert in southern New Mexico for a unique experience. And I knew the area very well as I was out in that desert many if not most weekends doing all sorts of things. So on a Saturday, I led a caravan of cars down miles of dirt roads across the desert, not far from the border of Mexico in that beautiful desert. Well, after leading the group in all kinds of activities, night came upon us, and I asked everyone to follow me away from a large bonfire uh, that we had built to where the desert was pitch black. In fact, the vast stars of the Milky Way appeared so close it, it felt as if we had to duck. And it was then that I asked my brother's friends to commit to being silent for just five minutes. Can you all be silent for just, just five minutes? Trust me on this, I said. Well, five minutes at their request turned into 10, and 10 into 15, and 15 into 20, and so on. My brother's friends, most from either L.A. or New York City, had never heard silence like that before in their lives. Many, in fact, were quite stunned by the impact of that desert experience. Quiet, silence, peace, calm, empty space. The feeling we get after a long exhale, after a, a deep breath. Can you feel that? Can you even remember such a way of being? Peace and calm quiet. Well, in an article not long ago in the magazine The Week, one person writes, be honest, you sense it in yourself, that vague mist of worry that lurks in the background, ebbing and flowing throughout the day. You can detect an agitated drive to do even more to protect those you love from an endless stream of dangers and threats. And the urge to keep up with friends, acquaintances, and news online during almost every waking moment, perhaps crowding out sleep. Our anxiousness feels more acute, more pervasive, more deeply woven into the fabric of our lives and world. On that point, perhaps, the American Psychiatric Association has recently found that roughly 39% of us as Americans are more anxious than we were a year ago. That number is now creeping toward 50% or more anxious than a year ago. The APA also notes that people are becoming increasingly anxious about health and safety and finances. And to many of us, it certainly it feels as if we have less and less control over things that have an impact on us. Now, most researchers that are looking into all of this don't believe there's just one reason behind our increasing angst, as the causes are multiple and have come together to create a, a confusing tipping point of fear. Now, here's just a snapshot of, of what some research is showing us to what some of our angst triggers are. And again, we can't just look at one alone, but we, we rather must take into account the synergy of all of this stuff coming together. So here are just a few of the factors that are causing us angst. Again, all of them, not just one, but all of them coming together. From 1966 to 1999, mass shootings in America happened every 180 days or so. Now it's every 47. No place or location is immune. Every time we received a text message, whether or not we know it, we get a hit of dopamine in our brains. It feels good. And so we begin to crave that continual hit of dopamine. And when we don't feel it, we feel as if something is wrong or missing because we're not getting that hit we subtly crave. So we work endlessly to stay connected. Then there's artificial intelligence. Shifting the way we live and communicate, affecting labor markets, 
AI is contributing to the rust of the rust belt where jobs are never going to come back as the way they used to be due to automation. AI has resulted in fully automated kitchens, living spaces, home and security systems, and people in a lot of homes now speak to their dishwashers and thermostats more often than to the person standing right next to them. So much of our life now is in the cloud. And Forbes magazine recently noted that across so many different areas of American life, that volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity is the name of the game. Just think of all the cultural shifts over the last decade and how we do things and how we relate to one another. By the way, what is a video store or a camera with film? What on earth is cursive? They don't teach that in schools anymore. A handwritten note, really? From where I sit, it's impossible to keep up with the pace of change. And while this is the case, and lots of us I mentioned are stressing out over all this, I have to say that it's not all bad, of course. I've got to state something that is wonderful and fabulous and opposite for just a moment, and that is that some of the radical and rapid changes we are experiencing are either very positive or have very beneficial impacts. Think what's happening in medicine. Think of communication systems that help people who need to get help fast get it. Think of greater travel safety, a greater awareness of how people are oppressed in a variety of ways, a growing intolerance for sexism and people in positions of power taking advantage of people. Think of the advances in the third world where technology is bringing about basic public health and water. Take the access to education online that many people some time ago never would have dreamed of being able to take advantage of. Take all the advances in science. Take being able to know where your kids are, even if they don't know you know where they are, <laughs> by simply looking at a small device in your hand. There's a lot of change that's really, really good, life-changing, life-enhancing, and liberating. But from where I sit, and from what I hear, and from what I see, a lot of us are feeling anxious these days about a lot of things, and fear is not a foreign concept to many. There's one symptom of fear I see every day, and it's astonishing. And the symptom I see of fear every day is anger. Did you know, and perhaps you do know, that anger is always about underlying fear. Well, given all this, today I begin my short two-part series titled, My Teeth Are Chattering and It's Not Cold Outside. In other words, a lot of us are dealing with worry and fear and angst in varying degrees, and we even experience it physically, hence the reference to chattering. Now, I do want to point out just very briefly before we go on that anxiety and fear and angst, all of these things are on a continuum from just passing things for some of us that we rarely experience to being consumed by worry and angst where our lives are, are really impeded and it's hard to function day in and day out. And all of us are somewhere on that continuum. But I do want to say that if you are on the end of the continuum in which you are consumed by angst and fear, let us help you at the chapel get the help that can be so helpful, because there's great help out there. But anyway, we are all on a continuum of stress and fear and worry, and even if you yourself don't deal with it a lot, you know many people around you who do. Now what I want to get into now is not how to treat the kind of anxiety and fear that over 40 million Americans are dealing with that needs and responds to treatment. But rather what I want to get into is how we might, as followers of Jesus, respond to a vastly changing world that creates angst for many of us in varying degrees. Well, to help us get started, I thought it would be helpful to look at a few situations in Scripture. Stories about how people of great faith 
sometimes got rather flipped out. It's kind of cool to know that some of the people in Scripture, some of the giants of faith that were right there with Jesus, it's great to know, at least for me, it's great to know that they sometimes really had a hard time with anxiety, and Jesus was right there with them. And it's my hope that through some of these stories, although the circumstances in our own lives are going to be very different, that we may relate to some of the basic underlying reasons that these people experience so much angst. So let's look at just a few for a few moments. Take, of course, the well-known story of Mary. Mary, a young woman who was engaged to a fellow named Joseph. And while we don't know what they were, obviously Mary and Joseph had plans together for their life. Obviously they did. We don't know what they were, but they must have. We also know that Joseph had integrity. We can glean that from the story in Luke that we read. And I'd imagine that for Joseph and Mary, that taking things in traditional order was part of their plan. Work, get married, have children, have a family, do things in a way that would not cause too much of a stir was probably their M.O., but how they envisioned the future, the well-ordered plans they had in mind, how they had hoped things would work out in a way that was shared by many young couples, their way of doing things. In one acute moment, all of this, their sense of who they were and how they would live, all of it was upended from top to bottom. And life for Mary and Joseph fundamentally changed, radically, in every way imaginable, suddenly. Now, for sure, some of us here today have had life upended suddenly in ways that we never anticipated or planned for. Sure, the change Mary and Joseph went through was positive. I guarantee at first it may not have felt that way as everyone in those days would have looked not so favorably upon them. And when life turns on a dime or 180 degrees for us, when things happen we never anticipate, Aren't fear and angst part of the deal when it just changes like that? Or how about the disciples in our story this morning? They are on a boat on a massive lake in a beautiful setting with an amazing guy they fully trusted, believed in, and were committed to. Nighttime and the mother of all storms hits. Huge waves, horrendous wind gusts, a flooding hull, Violent pitching and rolling and churning stomachs and all that goes along with it, I'm sure, were the name of the game. The one they had been with, Jesus, who had done so many amazing things and turned bad into good, seemingly at the moment, in the midst of all this, was either disinterested as he was asleep or he could do nothing about their plight. And when we're in a tough time and at first someone or something we have counted on does not seem to be of any help. People we love or care or depend on don't seem to be of any help. My hunch is we not only experience isolation, but angst and fear among a lot of other feelings. And certainly that was the case for the fellows in the boat that night when their source of trust simply slept at first. Or how about the woman with a bleeding disorder Imagine medical care 2,000 years ago, let alone the knowledge. This woman had suffered for over a decade, 12 years, in fact. She spent all of her money trying to get help. Lots of docs had seen her, yet her suffering only increased. And no matter what she did, she did not get better. And I know there are many of us that experience health issues that just don't seem to get better. But for this woman, people also had questions and probably whispered behind her back, what the heck is wrong with her? It must be in her mind. It's gone on so long. And then she hears the news of a healer, and she thinks, if I can just get near him, maybe, maybe, maybe he will be the answer. So she learns the healer is nearby, and so she thrusts herself into the midst of a jostling crowd. She reaches out and just touches his clothes, just a fringe. He stops and turns around and says, who touched me? And we're told she trembles in fear. 
Well, now, centuries later, we face something. Solutions are seemingly nowhere to be found. Despair sets in. We decide to go out on a limb and take a chance and put everything on the line. We question ourselves. People question us for putting everything on the line. We're uncertain. Is it the right thing to do to put all my eggs in this basket, to put hope in this? Fear and angst, for sure. And finally, take the 12-year-old Jesus. He and his folks travel to Jerusalem for a big deal religious event, and when it's over, mom and dad and a crowd of other folks head home. Little did they know that Jesus decided to stay behind to do some work on his own spiritual journey. And when Mary and Joseph are about a day's travel time out of Jerusalem, they ask, where is Jesus? And like Waldo, he's nowhere to be found. (laughs) Three days later, they find him in the temple in Jerusalem, and they admonish him and tell him that they had been filled with worry. They were angry, too. There's that anger and fear combination. They were afraid. How do we feel when we don't know how someone we love is doing? How do we feel when we don't know how someone is doing mentally? We can't get our hands around it. We can't understand it. How do we feel when we don't know how someone we care and love is doing emotionally? How do we feel when someone we cherish, we don't know where they are physically? How do we feel when we don't know? Fear? Absolutely. Well, these stories and so many others like them highlight that people who had heard about Jesus were physically around Jesus and turned to Jesus, even though he was right here, all had moments of tremendous fear and anxiety and consuming stress. And these stories of these giants of our faith tell me that when we experience fear and anxiety, the last thing we should ever think about doing is adding to it by giving ourselves a hard time for being anxious and fearful and fighting against it. All these giants of faith tell me that when we feel anxious or fearful or afraid, maybe we need to stop questioning ourselves or putting ourselves down or questioning our faith or being critical of ourselves in any way. Their experiences, our experiences, tell me that what we're doing is we're living human life. Their experiences, our experience, is part of what it means to be alive. It's part of what it means to have faith. Anxiety and faith is part of the faith journey. It's a signal that we're on an amazing journey of faith and that just like God called each of those I mentioned in these stories to trust and let go of fear, God asks us to do the same. You may, you may remember last week I preached on trust, that sometimes God just wants us to grit our tre- teeth into trust, and I asked if it's hard. Yes, I said, and you all nodded. But God also asks us to let go of fear. And it's something we're called to work on day after day. So just a few more minutes. I'm going to touch on just a few little things to think about with regard to managing our fear as followers of Jesus and in these changing times. And next week, I'm going to get into a bunch more. But just to get us started, the letter to the Philippians has great advice. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. And then you receive peace from God. Where are we focusing our attention? What are we looking at on the screens? What are we talking about? What are we willing to spend time listening to? Are we focusing on what is true and honorable and right and pure? There's a great word, pure 
and lovely, lovely and admirable? Is this where we're investing our time and our energy and our attention? If we're investing our time and energy and attention to the things that are opposite of such things, of course our teeth are going to chatter and more. We're not going to be very happy. and We're not going to experience much peace. So great little simple advice right here. Where are we focusing our attention? On these things? Just think of those words. Think of these words today. Take this with you and ask yourself, am I focusing on what is lovely and right and pure and admirable and true? Two other things I'm going to invite you to do this week. And... Um, like exercise, it's all a matter of doing it. Faith is like a muscle, we gotta exercise it for it to be strong. So there are a couple things I'm gonna invite you to do this week if you want to begin to work on this journey of dealing with fear and angst. The first may be obvious and it's gonna take a little bit of work, but I invite you to think about somebody in your life who you know, who you trust, who is a prayer warrior. Call them, talk to them, share with them what it is that is causing you to feel angst and fear right now in your life. And get them to commit for the next week to pray for you every day during the coming week. And select somebody and choose somebody that's going to do that for you on your behalf. And there are people that will. And then after that week, check in with them. What did you experience as you were praying for me Here's what I experienced is I knew you were praying for me. Does that take work and effort? Yes. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to join me in doing something. Remember I began our sermon today talking about being out in the desert of southern New Mexico at night. Then I took a group of friends out to the space and I asked them to be quiet. Well, you may not be able to go to southern New Mexico. In fact, there are parts of the border I probably wouldn't recommend you go to. But I'd like you to go find a quiet place and do this every day, 10, 15 minutes. Go to a quiet place, turn everything off, give yourself some open-ended time, get quiet, get silent, listen to the silence for a while, pay attention to the silence. What's this silence like? What's happening to me in this silence? And then pray in the midst of the silence, pray and listen. And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now, and you can take this prayer and you can massage it and use your own words, but it's the kind of prayer I invite you all to do in silence this week. And do it more than once, I pray. See what happens. And my hunch is that if you do just these three things, which is really not that much, but if you're really attentive to what you're paying attention to, and focus this week on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. If you ask somebody to pray for you, and if you do the following, I think your week's going to be vastly different. So let us now turn to a, a time of prayer, and uh, I will lead you in this. And again, it's something that you can do yourselves. So let us pray.